Okay, we're now uh, all up and running and all set to start. Oh, we got work 10 minutes early. <laughs> no problem. All right, so we'll just let people wander in, but everything should be all set for today.
Come era quello sulla credit assignment qualcosa? Non no. trovo più le mie cuffie, ragazzi. Ce l'avevo qui. Ma me le passi? Perché le hanno messo? Le... No. Sì, sì, entrambe. Tutte le cuffie. Queste sono le mie passi e queste sono già. Sei sicuro? Perché io ce l'avevo appoggiate qua. Sì, oddio, scusa, sono piene perché ho, ho le altre. Quelle che io avevo appoggiate qua. Non Ma se non c'è sopra? No, le ho portate giù apposta per il mio. Tra l'altro c'è anche una forchetta qua. Adesso devo cercarla. Mi connetto solo così. Hi. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Doing well. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. I just attended another meeting in Genova of Giulio. <laughs> Right, the iPod meeting. Uh -huh, yes. <laughs> I saw I thought for the was Francesco presenting. Right, yeah, it wasn't in Genoa, it was London probably. Yeah. From London, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So Cornelia, are you the host of the day today? I am, yeah, but I mean oh, good. I will introduce your speaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe so, I mean the we can yeah we are at eleven o'clock. Mm -hmm. We can we can start. So the main things. Welcome again. The main things today on the schedule are a lecture by Friedman Senke from the Duck Group. Okay, and then we have an invited short. Credit assignment in neural networks to keep feedback control by Ben Grebe. And later on, a tutorial in the SMI group by Emre Nefje on how to train neuromorphic hardware. So, Chiara, it's your speaker. Okay, thanks, Cornelia. Um, today, uh, we have invited uh, Friedemann. Um, who is uh, working as a computational neuroscientist at the University of Basel. And uh, he's working on learning, memory, and information processing in biologically inspired neural networks and uh, in, in brackets, there is written spiking. So I think it's a, of interest for the whole um, community here. And uh, I wanted to add that um, uh, he's the organizer of a very nice workshop. Uh, that is a Snoopa workshop. I don't know, Friedemann, if you want to kind of announce it and spend a couple of words about what is going to happen in, in November. So the stage is yours. Thanks for coming. 
Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and thanks to all the organizers actually for putting this up. Um, I know it's, it's virtual, but it's still a lot of work. So I, I think it's great. Thank you very much. Um, and I will I'll talk briefly in the end about this NUFA workshop in November. We still have a little uh, scheduling issue, issue with SFN. So, so the dates might still shift by a week, but I'll mention it later. Can you all hear me well? And can you see my slides now? Good, I see some nods, that's a good sign. Uh, so yeah. works, yes. That's great. So this talk is going to be actually um, leading up, I think quite nicely to uh, some of the talks that come later um, by Emre and also by Benny. And really, I wanna give you a bit of an overview of what we're interested in, what we're doing with spiking neural networks and why we're doing it. Um, so in computational neuroscience, which is really the field that I'm working in mainly, and we're now in the privileged uh, situation that we have pretty good models of single neuron dynamics. So here, what I'm showing you is a recording by Olivier Hagens um, and a model by Christian Pozzarini in the Gerstner lab. And if I didn't tell you which voltage trace here is the model and which one is the, um, is the real recording from the neuron, you would probably have a hard time telling, although after looking for some time at, the, at these red spikes and seeing that they're all exactly the same height, you might notice, okay, this is probably the model and in black, you have the voltage trace. So this is the response of a single pyramidal cell uh, that's shown here on the left or a similar one to this noisy current at the input. And that's just to say, we have a pretty good understanding mathematically in form of these generalized leaky integrin fire models of how we can describe the input output dynamics of such individual neurons. However, at the network level, which is really what we want to understand because we would like to build such networks for better AI, um, we, we lack this kind of understanding. And that's really funny because on the one hand, of course, uh, we all carry a brain and a massive neural network uh, around with us all the time. And on the other hand, also nowadays, we deal a lot with artificial neural networks uh, and we also carry them around in form of smartphones or at least that our smartphones use them, for instance, to do uh, translation or speech recognition and also self-driving cars heavily rely on deep neural networks nowadays to function. And that's um, a somewhat um, a conundrum of sorts if you want, because nobody really understands how neural networks work. Um, and the computer scientists even who engineer deep neural networks do not fully understand how they operate internally. And that is due partially to a bit of a paradigm shift in how we generate them which means in, gen in general, we kind of set up a course architecture and then we train these networks with massive amounts of data. So um, the quest is really, how do we get a better understanding of how this processing works and how, do we, how can we fix it if it breaks in the brain or how can we empower robots or smart systems uh, with some of these ideas further? So why is this even such a big problem to get a functional uh, neural network in real life? And the problem is, that the search space of all possible networks is absolutely uh, astronomically large. And to illustrate this, I like to give this example where I've drawn a sketch of a network with 17 nodes only. And the question is how many possible ways are there if we ignore permutation symmetries, how many possible ways are there of wiring up these 17 neurons with an arrow? So the arrow is either there or it's not there. We can point in both directions and we, allow, we also allow for self connections for simplicity. Um, then basically the number of possible configurations that you have is two to the 17 to the two which is staggeringly large. Uh, it's roughly 10 to the 87 and um, possible combinations for such a small network. And that's of course really remarkable because not all of these possible networks would perform any useful function. And that's specifically remarkable knowing that animals and us have many more neurons in our brains than 17. In fact, this number 17 was chosen because this roughly comes out to a number of possible configurations, which is roughly 10 million times larger than the atoms the number of atoms in, in the universe, or at least the known universe. So it is truly an astronomically large number. So as brains and also as modelers, uh, we need to have um, effective ways of navigating this really ginormous search space of possible networks and find the networks that actually implement the computations uh, that we're interested in. And that's really the topic of the talk. And what are the underlying rules 
that determine this transition, going from one randomly interwoven network out of this very big storage space to one which has a specific connectivity to it that gives it and equips it with a defined computational function that we can use. And um, we, over the last years, um, and, uh, and others too, took massive inspiration in how to do this for biologically inspired networks from deep learning. And one paper which was uh, really truly a bit of an eye opener for me at the time was a, a paper by Dan Yamens from the DiCarlo lab, um, where what they did was to record from the monkey ventral stream activity. Um, in, so the visual system of the monkey, they recorded activity from multiple areas, uh, from multiple neurons, when the monkey was looking at images. Um, and it was performing a task. And the behavioral task the monkey was solving was the following. Basically, had to look at the images and say whether there is a tree or no tree in the image. So it was a binary classification. And, and monkeys can learn this. And that's what they did. And then they trained, uh, trained a deep neural network. I think it was an AlexNet, uh, so a convolutional neural network, to perform the same task. And then they also recorded from, um, the, uh, from the, the activity from the convolutional neural network, and they compared the activity of both networks. And what they found was really striking. So, um, specifically, what they found are tuning curves. Um, and that's what's shown here at the bottom. So in black, you have um, the neural activity or the neural average response to a specific image stimulus. Whereas in red, you have the best model prediction. Um, so it's a linear regression essentially from activity from the network model, from the artificial network model uh, to explain the activity of that neuron in the brain. Um, and the fact that they could explain so much variance, in fact, like almost up to 50%, which at the time was a lot more variance uh, than the best models that were specifically built to capture the activity of the ventral stream and the visual system. These were these control models down here. Uh, that was remarkable because this model uh, that they used was never actually trained on reproducing the activity. It was just trained on a task uh, on solving this specific problem. So um, this was a bit of a turning point, I think, for a lot of people in computational neuroscience. We started to take this deep learning business more seriously. Uh, and now it kind of there's a bit of a paradigm shift that it might actually be a tremendously useful tool for understanding how you make this transition from a random network to one that has function. So, of course, there are many um, biologically implausible aspects about deep learning, for instance, convolutions, weight sharing, uh, then there are no neuron types, uh, specifically there are no inhibitor in neurons usually. Uh, so all things that we have in biology, which are missing. And we largely ignore developmental plasticity aspects, many structural aspects. Um, importantly, usually we use supervised learning uh, meaning we use labeled data to train these networks, which is again something that biological neural networks don't have the luxury of doing usually. They probably are trained in an unsupervised way. Um, and finally, um, the, the normal artificial neural networks use uh, graded activation functions uh, for the sake of differentiability, and certainly they do not use spikes, which is the language that the neurons in the brain are using. So the questions we set out with that were, um, focused basically on these last points. So we were wondering, can we use similar end-to-end -end training or learning approaches as I used in deep learning to build more plausible network models, specifically spiking neural network models? And can we use this also, uh, this optimization framework as a framework to better understand neural plasticity in the brain and how similar algorithms that iteratively refine connections in the brain to improve the input output uh, to learn uh, ultimately and uh, whether they're implemented in brain networks. So the task for today's talk is um, we want to move towards, um, towards this principle where we have a complicated network architecture, which is drawn from this big random design space um, and where maybe there's, there's some modular or some kind of layer structure as you know it from deep learning. And we want to implement some sophisticated function to mimic this process uh, that animals and us have to do where we go from sensory inputs um, to ultimately behavior. And to, to do this in a modeling framework, we need to come up with abstractions. First, we need to come up with an abstraction for the, our input models. Then we need to come up with an abstraction for our output. Usually we don't have behavior unless you actually do work with robots, then you do have a form of behavior. So we need to come up with a useful abstraction for the desired output. Uh, and then we want to implement this sophisticated function. 
And for this, we need to find the right connectivity. So what are the synaptic weights in this network? What's the structure that's required? And so let's just walk through these steps. So this is the general layout for any kind of uh, deep learning scenario. You fix the architecture, you have a data set as an input, you have a desired output, and you, you can train, find the connectivity using uh, gradient descent methods. Um, Right, so let's talk about the input paradigm. So in the spiking world, the inputs are likely spikes. In most cases, there are actually spikes. And here's an example of the spiking activity from the somatosensory cortex in the primate. And that's actually a touch example, which I pulled off the bioarchive recently, where the primate senses different textures uh, with, a, with a finger. So this monkey. And you can clearly see these are spike raster plots where you have time on the x-axis and different trials and neurons uh, organized along the y-axis. You can clearly see that different textures elicit different spatial temporal spike patterns here as an input. Similarly, time. And, and spatial dynamics play a role also in vision. For instance, here's an example from the retina where you again, you have a spike raster plot of a ganglion cell in response to an image that's projected. And specifically, it's a ganglion cell that, uh, that looks, um, or a bunch of cells that look at this row here in the image. And you can clearly see the contrast modulation of the spike time, the first spike. Uh, and also there's rate modulation. So if you were to reconstruct the image from these spikes, this is the image, for instance, you would get from relative latency to the first spike. So clearly, again, time plays an essential role here in encoding the stimulus. And lastly here, this is actually an artificial data set, which we've built precisely for our purposes. This is to mimic how spikes, for instance, in your um, cochlear nucleus um, look like that uh, could be served then as an input to your auditory cortex, for instance, in response to the, in this case, to the spoken word six. Uh, so here again, a spike raster plots of how this how this could look like. Um, right. So in a way, that's that's the rule of the game. So if you want to use uh, this kind of data driven or learning approach to build functional models, you need large data sets, which is why uh, Benjamin Kramer in this case um, went out about and recorded um, a large data set because at the time most public uh, most data sets that were were available there were. Um, still protected under copyright laws. We wanted something that's fully open source. So we recorded our own spoken digit data set. Well, Benjamin did actually, not we, um, and cut, it, uh, cut this and remastered this and then fed this through a realistic and high performance cochlear model, which then gave us these kind of output patterns. And you can get the data set. So here are some more inputs. This is the six I've shown you earlier, which looks particularly nice, but in principle, you have now 10,000 data points in this data set, which comprise these input spike trains um, to train spiking neural networks and study what their representations look like and how they, how they actually solve these problems. Uh, we also released simultaneously a larger data set, larger corpus based on a Google um, speech commands data set, which was, was, was actually publicly available then during the time of the making of this. Right, so once you have these data sets, we can move on to how do we do the optimization in our, in our framework and how do we get this spiking network that's um, actually capable of solving real problems. And for the sake of the talk, I'll just use uh, simple toy examples. And the toy example uh, that I'm using here today is basically based on the idea that uh, rodents, they sense a lot of the surrounding world through their whiskers. So again, a form of uh, touch. Uh, so they have this vibrissa system and they have a large part of the cortex dedicated to analyzing the signals that come from their whiskers. And suppose we want to solve as a rodent here, this discrimination problem between two textures that we kind of wrap our mustache over, the orange and the blue texture. And every time we do this, we might end up with a different set of spatial temporal spikes that enter our barrel cortex. And just from these spikes, we would like to tell the difference between these textures. Um, and of course, these spike trains won't be always exactly the same. There will be some kind of complicated correlations. And in fact, here for the example, I'm using synthetic data generated from smooth random manifolds. Uh, so there is an entire manifold corresponding to orange, orange texture spike trains in this example, and an entire one uh, corresponding to blue texture spike trains. Right. So then the next step is we need to come up with an output abstraction. So, and the way we do this for our spiking networks is typically that we define a set of readout units um, at the uh, output of the network. And these readout units, um, and what we usually do, we assume they're non-spiking. 
but there are many different ways of doing this. Um, if they're non-spiking, we can basically look at their activation history here over time. And now we can ask, how do we implement a classification problem or how do we train this network? And to do this, we need a loss function um, that, that we can then take gradients off to train the network. And to implement a loss function on these continuous time quantities, what we usually do is we take the maximum of the blue curve here, and then maybe the maximum of the orange curve here. And we feed this, and so the maximum over time, sorry. And we feed this into a softmax. Um, and that's an idea we got from the Tempertron, a similar work by Robert Gutig and Chaim Sambulinski. Um, but there are other ways of how you can define this. You know, in the end, you just need to get somehow rid of, of, of time. You need to compress it for most learning approaches. Um, and then you can plug this into any kind of standard uh, cross entropy loss function that you know from your favorite deep learning um, libraries. Okay. so. With this, you basically now could have a spiking neural network model with an input abstraction and input data set recorded and, and the output fixed uh, with a bunch of labels. For instance, if you wanna do supervised learning for a classification task. Okay, how do we train the network now? And of course we'd like to do um, gradient descent. Again, we would like to apply uh, well-proven methods. And there are two things that you need to know essentially. The first one is that spiking neurons themselves, they're essentially little recurrent neural networks by themselves. So if we consider a leaky integrated fire neuron here in blue, uh, which is a very commonly used point neuron model, um, and it gets a bunch of inputs. And here I'm showing you the input spikes here of a small population of input neurons. Um, and this is a current-based model, which uses exponentially decaying uh, synaptic currents. So every time a spike arrives, this current variable I of this neuron jumps here by a little jump and then decays exponentially. And this current now is fed into the membrane potential of the neuron, where it also again decays exponentially. So you get these nicely double filtered um, EPSPs in response to input spikes. And when you increase the input firing rate and this neuron reaches its firing threshold here given by the dashed line, it emits an output spike train after which its dynamics are reset. So, um, so if you've seen this before, these are the bare bones, very simply stick equations that you would usually simulate with a forward Euler integration scheme in discrete time to simulate these dynamics. You have here this uh, current variable I, which depends in time step n plus one of the previous time step of itself decayed um, by some constant factor alpha, which is smaller than one, plus any given feed forward spiking input weighted by the input weights. If we have recurrent connections, there might also be recurrent weights. Similarly, the, uh, the membrane potential variable U uh, is obtained in a similar way. So it just kind of decays. It's a, it's, a version, it's a decayed version of its former self in the previous time step, plus the input current. And then you have here the, the output spike drain of the same neuron as a reset. This is again, a very simple uh, model, but you could make it much more complicated and more realistic. But for illustration purposes, let's stick with this one. And then this voltage enters a um, nonlinearity to determine whether you've crossed the threshold. And here we use a heavy side nonlinearity and that's the threshold. So these equations you can write in a computational graph, which looks like this, um, where you have time going uh, to the right, and you have the different state variables here lined up, input spike train, current, um, voltage, output spike train, and so forth. And why is this important that we, we, that we can draw this graph, um, which corresponds essentially to a neural network that's unrolled in time. So the take home message here is that spiking neurons and automatically also networks of spiking neurons, they are technically speaking recurrent neural networks, and there are known training procedures to get gradients for such networks with hidden units and everything. So, uh, and the most commonly used ones are back propagation through time or real-time recurrent learning. So that's good for us because um, we can um, directly apply these methods uh, with everything we've got now. So there's one issue here, one caveat, and that's that we have a heavy side function in this, um, in this model definition, which of course, if you take the derivative off, um, can cause some problems. And I want to illustrate why this causes problems because of course we can uh, use PyTorch now and simulate such a spiking network, um, but I just wanna see that nothing happens. So here is our example again, we have a small network, 20 hidden layer neurons, some input layer neurons, I think 30, 
Um, and here you see the input spike trains. Here these are different examples now corresponding to these manifolds. So you see these are different spike trains at the input and we want to classify this. And before we train, there's hardly any hidden layer activity. So there's actually just, there are just two spikes here, um, hardly any activity. And the readout neurons, they get this wrong. So remember, we want the maximum to be given by the uh, correct input class here, which should have been orange. So this network hasn't learned anything. And if we now apply gradient descent with uh, the framework we've just laid out, then also the loss doesn't change over time. And the reason is uh, due directly to this heavy side nonlinearity. So spikes are binary events. They're either there or they're not there, meaning that, um, meaning that if we take now derivatives um, during gradient computation of this nonlinearity, the gradient will be either zero or it will be infinite, which is bad for optimization. So in other terms, you can think of the optimization landscape as looking like this in a way. So it's a, it's this kind of step function um, all the way down. And if you compute the gradient anywhere, it's either zero or infinite. Either way, you cannot follow the negative gradient to get to the bottom of this and thereby uh, do the optimization. So a lot of people have thought about this problem in many contexts in the past. And, and the, the first option is the classic option is that you add noise to your network and then you, you actually can and compute often gradients and expectation values. It works reasonably well, but it comes with the, with the downside that sometimes uh, you have to add a lot of noise. The noise might multiply over layers. And sometimes it's very difficult actually to get this to work in larger at larger scale. Um, the other option is that you dispense with the spikes altogether and you go to a, um, a continuously differentiable or smoothly differentiable system. So you can make the spikes differentiable and then you can anneal this over time. And that way you can train a spiking neural network. Um, again, another option is that for some magic reasons and this works, only works in some cases with a limited number of hidden layers, uh, you can know where you want hidden layer spikes and you can thereby reduce the problem uh, substantially. And these are approaches like as in spike force learning um, and also in similar work by Aditya Gildra and Wolfram Gerstner. Uh, so this works uh, typically for a recurrent neural network with one hidden layer. Um, and the approach that now many of us have taken recently is what we call surrogate gradients. And I think also Emre will talk about it a little bit later. In fact, in effect, this, these methods have been around for a long time uh, in machine learning in the context of straight through estimators where they were used to train um, often um, binary neural networks, for instance, without the time aspect. Um, but they were, they've now kind of, uh, they've gone through a renaissance recently uh, where they're used more and more to actually train spiking neural networks. Right, so, and if we go back to our simple example and we now apply this surrogate grad gradient trick, which I haven't really explained, I think I'm missing a slide. Oh, no, actually it was on the slide. So what's the trick actually uh, for the surrogate gradient? The trick is that we, whenever we compute the gradient and we encounter one of these heavy side nonlinearities, which would give us the headache, we replace it with a soft nonlinearity. Okay, and if you do this, then you will automatically soften out the loss landscape and you can perform optimization again. So it's a very simple trick. Um, right, so if we do this in our example, uh, we use the surrogate gradient that's exactly the same network as I've shown you before. Then after training, you will see that this network will ha has now a very rich and complicated looking, looking hidden state. And if you talk to people who work in barrel cortex, um, they, they, they will say, okay, this looks almost as uninterpretable than uh, like our recordings from barrel cortex, for instance. Uh, so which is in a way a good thing because perhaps actually the networks that we're training, they're solving certain aspects of these problems in a similar way, which is of course what we're hoping, uh, but it remains to be established. Importantly, however, what you can appreciate is that with these spikes in the hidden layer, this network has now figured out how to solve the problem. So orange is max here, here you have blue max, and here you have orange max again. This is exactly what is supposed to be doing. So underlying all of this optimization is an approximation. And one question I usually get immediately is, yeah, well, but how good is the approximation? How robust is this? How much does this depend on which 
function you replace um, the step function with in your, in your grading computation. And turns out it's actually rather robust. So we tried this out for a bunch of different functions that are used in the field. For instance, Steve Esser and Guillaume Belek and Wolfgang Maas group, they have been traditionally using a, um, as a surrogate a non-linearity, if you want, uh, like the, the, this derivative of this function, they've been using uh, linear or piecewise linear functions. Um, in our work, we've used a fast sigmoid or the derivative thereof, and then you could also use the derivative of a sigmoid. And then of course, these all these derivatives, they could have a different um, angle or a different slope, how steep you make them. That's here encoded in the color or by this parameter beta. And then what we did is we just trained networks on the same task. Um, and what, you what I'm showing down here is this is a grid search over different learning rates for different um, parameter beta and so slopes of these nonlinearities. And what you can see is that these plots, they all have regions uh, for suitable hyperparameters choices um, uh, of the learning rate where they perform really well. So that's really good news, meaning that if you have the right initialization and the right hyperparameter, it doesn't really matter which nonlinearity you use for this task. It seems to be, um, and it seems to almost not matter what the slope is and what nonlinearity you, you use. Uh, and that's very reassuring in terms of the robustness. So there's not much hacking involved. Uh, importantly, this task that I'm showing you here is one of these synthetic tasks, uh, which we set up in such a way that if there's no hidden layer, uh, the network can't solve it. These are the black lines here. Uh, none of these nonlinearities can. If you add a hidden layer, it does really well. If you add a second one, it does even a little bit better. Um, but importantly, if you now remove the nonlinearity altogether by setting it constantly to one, then you're back at the performance level, even though you have a hidden layer, you're back to the performance level of a network as if it didn't have a, a hidden, um, as if it didn't have a hidden layer. And that's telling you that there's something really intrinsically very important about having uh, this nonlinearity in the learning to be able to, um, to learn certain tasks. Right, so having established that this is actually robust, one thing, of course, we were interested in this is, uh, was to see whether it's also robust enough to actually let this run on hardware. And to make this even more difficult, we, um, we actually were interested in whether this could empower analog neuromorphic hardware, which um, has a lot of problems with, for instance, device mismatch sometimes, which um, which is actually biologically more plausible, but it's difficult to train because it's difficult to build accurate models and then upload uh, these models into hardware. So the question was really, can we, can we get analog neuromorphic hardware to work with these systems? And so we teamed up with a, the group in Heidelberg, uh, at the time still with Karl-Heinz Meyer, who sadly died, uh, as you might know, um, and now we're collaborating with Johannes Schemmel on, on the kind of brain scale system, which is really the brain, child of, of both of them, um, which is one such analog neuromorphic hardware system. And um, specifically for all the experiments which were done here by Benjamin and Sebastian, two very bright grad students in Heidelberg, we were using the brain scales to a single chip system to test this out. And here's a picture of the single chip where you have the synapses here in this shiny area and then the neurons here on the side. Um, and each neuron in the circuit is implemented as a little RC circuit, which has a comparator, which then kind of, if you hit the threshold, basically emits the spike. And otherwise it's really the substrate that does the integration of this leaky integrator here. So it's, it's perfect. So you can do um, electrophysiology, just how you would do it with the real thing on the chip. And here you see a neuron uh, on the oscilloscope emit two spikes in response to an external current stimulus. So, and you can see there is some noise here and probably so the power circuit or the, uh, the lighting or something has been feeding into these neurons. So it's, it's almost um, um, like in biology. So you have to deal with all of this also um, to, to cope with this and, and perform computation. So, and one major problem is this device mismatch that I already mentioned, that neurons in the computer, usually we assume they're all exactly the same, they're perfect uh, in our models, but in the hardware due to manufacturing differences, uh, some of the capacitances might be a little bit larger, a little bit lower, some resistance is a bit larger, a bit lower, so non, no neuron is the same essentially when you implement them in this analog substrate. 
because there's this, this variability. And that usually means that if you train a network in software and then upload it in hardware, so in, in, let's say we do MNIST here, we train a network, spiky network in software, we get relatively good performance. We upload it in hardware, it drops here by 10%. For MNIST, this is huge. This is terrible. Um, and so, and what here uh, Sebastian and uh, Benjamin came up with is a really neat way of incorporating um, this hardware into the surrogate gradient framework. So um, as you might remember, so the surrogate gradients, they require this voltage nonlinearity uh, that I was speaking about earlier. So they have to have this nonlinearity um, and the real voltage needs to go into it. Uh, the problem is on the hardware, we were not able to implement directly readily the full learning rule uh, for the surrogate gradient. So we took an in the loop approach. And what helped here is that the chip can record with an SADC the voltages of the neuron during each trial. And here in panel B, you see such voltage traces recorded from the chip in response to a certain input pattern. And then we can take these voltages, we can load them into the computational graph, which for the time being we compute in PyTorch. So this is the graph unrolled in time for the, for the network model in PyTorch, which of course is, has the perfect neurons in a way, it's not calibrated, but it's now, being, um, it's now being injected with the true voltage traces from the two neurons. And then we compute one weight update and we feed this back into the chip. Um, so this is really, um, was really the idea here by these bright students and it works really well. So here you have an example again of, um, of MNIST. In this, in this case, the images are on the top, the input spikes here with the latency code are shown here and they travel through uh, from top to bottom. And you can see that this accurately classifies now these images. Uh, you might also note that the time scale is here microseconds. It's because this hardware runs in accelerated time because the RC components um, determine the time scale and they're small. So it runs roughly a thousand times faster than biology. Um, it's also very fast and it's decision time. That's what's quantified here. So here we basically ask what's our error if we only take into account from the readout neurons, the first so many microseconds of output. And once you go to 10 microseconds, that's basically enough. Then you can always make a good decision. And if you combine this now with a smart reset that you kind of uh, reset all the neurons, be it through global inhibition or something similar after this time, you can basically get a very high throughput rate. Um, right. And uh, high, high test error. So I was, was looking for this image. So the, the rate basically that we're getting here, for instance, for MNIST on this single chip system with 200 neurons is um, 80,000 images per second. And the whole chip uses uh, roughly 200 milliwatts. Of course, that's not counting the readout electronics in this case, but that's, I think, a general problem, uh, which we all as a community need to look into how to actually benchmark truly and really. But here you can see now their work um, in a video where you see the chip is somewhere here, the readout electronics and the interface electronics are here. And in the background you have um, as fast as the USB can carry it in this case, uh, how it's crunching through MNIST and uh, with the occasional error, basically. So one thing that was cool is that this turned out to be self-calibrating. And so because the, vol the actual voltages are put into the computation of the computational uh, graph in the offline phase that we still simulate in the computer, um, we could we didn't have to calibrate the chip, which is usually something you need to do with um, analog electronic hardware where you have extra bias currents and extra um, modulation factors that you usually use for calibration. Here, we use them to artificially make the chip worse than it was um, by basically decalibrating the system even more and seeing how well the training could actually deal with it if you do it in the loop. And it turns out it, it could, deal with uh, substantial levels of decalibration. So here I'm showing you the training error um, for up to 30, 40% calibration. Essentially there's no difference for decalibration of thresholds, time constants, you name it. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in these neurons. So these are the corresponding distributions for membrane time constants, synaptic time constants, and the threshold or the bias current essentially. Um, so these neurons can be very dirty, but if training can take this into account somehow, it can be all incorporated and might even help in some cases to solve the problem. 
Similarly, if you train these networks now with dropout, which we can do in the software, they become very robust to neuron loss. So if you had a system that's deployed, but it's a very flimsy substrate where uh, you lose more and more neurons over time, if you take this into consideration during training, it gets actually automatically robust to this. So here I'm showing a test error and the fraction of uh, neurons that we silence, so we kill them um, artificially later after training the network. And if you factor this possibility in through the use, for instance, of dropout during training, then basically up to 15% neuron loss did not really affect the performance, which is of course very helpful. So this also worked on these type of speech data sets that we uh, made um, quite well. Um, and yeah, so I think it's it's pretty awesome <laughs> that that this is certainly something that did, I didn't expect to work out of the box so well. But uh, it's a, it's a powerful demonstrator that the surrogate gradient techniques really work also in hardware. Um, so what I've shown you so far is really that we really now have a good tool to bring end-to-end -end optimization to spiking networks, and that these methods are really robust and they're slowly getting more and more mature, and that they give us now everything we need to basically empower even analog neuromorphic hardware, but of course also digital neuromorphic hardware. And I think Emre will talk about it uh, later. So in the second part of my talk, what I really want to talk a little bit about more is um, what about biologically plausible learning. So all the learning I've shown you so far uh, was training with backpropagation through time essentially. And this is something that biology cannot easily do, um, but this is something that biology cannot easily do um, simply because it violates causality. So um, the two main problems that we need to solve if we want to, um, if we want to do learning in, in complicated networks, and one is the spatial credit assignment problem. That's basically which neuron somewhere deep in the hierarchy contributed to er errors at the output, which we want to minimize. Um, and there has been a flurry of recent papers that propose more plausible mechanisms that biology could implement, but that are also easier implementable on hardware. So actually this is interesting that hardware and biology uh, share certain constraints. They're both often bound by, um, by the laws of physics, for instance. So they need to obey causality in the sense that, um, that the time arrow has, has a direction. You cannot easily reverse it. So you cannot do back propagation through time often. And moreover, also loss of locality that certain information needs to be available at certain locations and cannot be just beamed uh, all over your chip or all over the neural network in your brain. So you usually need some kind of circuitry to get information where it needs to be. So I don't want to go into too much detail of uh, many of these recent uh, great works on uh, plausible credit assignment. I just want to give out a quick shout out to here yeah, the, the recent work um, by Alexandre Payer and uh, Jordan, together with Blake Richards and Richard No, um, where basically um, we tackle this problem also from a more biologically plausible angle uh, through burst multiplexing. So this is really um, looking into a plausible network model which has dendrites, certain forms of short-term plasticity, and it uses a biologically plausible burst multiplexed code to send feed forward information in one direction and um, feedback information in the other, other direction only using plausible mechanisms. So I recommend you take a look at it, uh, which published recently in Nature Neuroscience. So uh, what I would like to talk about for the remainder um, um, is temporal credit assignment, which is also important. I made this whole point about spikes and temporal patterns. So spikes are localized in time. And we usually would like to use spiking neural networks to process also temporal information. So temporal credit assignment is equally important. Uh, and if we wanna do it in biology or if we wanna run it on hardware, often it should be online. So we have to work around that back propagation through time. Um, and then later, I think you also, I forgot to mention this later, you have Benny's talk also on spatial credit assignment. So there's really no reason for me to talk about it now. So. <laughs> um, Right, let me come back briefly to this slide. So earlier I said that these known methods that we can use to train these networks, um, one is backpropagation through time and the other one is real-time recurrent learning. And real-time recurrent learning, many of you might not have heard it recently. And that's just because it's not used very often because it's quite inefficient to compute. Backpropagation is much more 
efficient to compute on a GPU. And real-time recurrent learning is orders of magnitude more computationally intense. Uh, and that's, not, that's why it's not used. But it is the same principle, and it's a recursion, recursion relationship to compute gradients. Uh, but this time for temporal problems, it's forward in time. So it's causal. So that's really what we want if we want to move uh, towards um, problems that are, uh, that have, uh, like if we want to move towards online learning. And two concepts that I want to briefly introduce because they'll become important in a moment is the notion of what we call explicit recurrence. Um, so explicit recurrence are in essence, all these orange arrows here in this computational graph on the left-hand side. So this is always when there's information that goes through synapses, if you want, from one neuron to the other neuron. So activity travels through a synapse from one neuron to another neuron, um, or also could travel through the same, to the same neuron through an autopsy, if you want. But then there's also this implicit recurrence. Usually in neuroscience, we wouldn't even consider this as recurrence, but this is where information or activity propagates through one neuron just through time. And these are the black arrows. So it's the leak of the membrane, it's the leak of this current variable, uh, for the exponentially decaying synaptic currents, for instance. So this is just the dependence of the history dependence. And technically speaking, these are also forms of recurrence and usually they're fixed, but they don't have to be in a model. So this is what we call implicit recurrence. Why is this important? Because what RTRL does is it basically, when it takes derivatives of the uh, loss function, at some point you will come uh, to a point where you have to take a derivative of a spike train, an output spike train of a neuron like this orange one here at the top. And the way how it now navigates this problem about time is that basically, here I've just written down again our very simplified neuronal uh, equations that we simulate in forward time. In RTRL, what you do to take the derivatives of spike trains is you just take the derivative of this spike chain with respect to the parameters. Let's say we take it with respect to a parameter P, right? Um, so then, first of all, you have to take the derivative of the heavy side function. We already talked about this, that this would usually, oh, usually be problematic, sorry. This is gonna get better and better if I jump back and forth on these slides. So, so this, um, we're going to take care of then with a surrogate derivative, right? Otherwise this would already throw us an infinite or a zero and our whole, whole product here for computing the gradient through the chain rule would be gone. Um, so this is what we take care of for the surrogate derivative and then we just keep doing chain rule. So this spike train depends then on the voltage. So we take the derivative of the voltage, then we take here the derivative of the voltage and now something interesting happens. So remember, this is a dynamical system we're simulating in discrete time. Um, if we take now the derivative here of the voltage, um, then the same derivative in the previous time step appears here. So what we have now is actually we can start writing the all the variables that are important for computing the gradient. We can start writing them as a dynamical system themselves. And that might sound a little bit crazy at the moment, but um, what this means is that in principle, you could have some kind of local dynamics um, in a neuron or at a synapse that compute these things forward in time. The important thing is that here's an n plus one and here's an n. So this goes forward in time. So there's another quantity of i appearing here and some similar argument applies here. So the, the problem where this breaks down is are these terms here now here on the right hand side. So these terms, they come from the explicit recurrence that I mentioned earlier. These terms in this derivation correspond to stuff that's going through synapses and somehow coming back or going to other neurons. So this is intrinsically a non-local thing. Uh, I call them here the non-local mixed terms. And if it wasn't for them, we could compute everything locally as a little dynamical system at the synapse, at the neuron very neatly. And this is really what breaks uh, locality and makes things more complicated. So, um, but what if we ignore these terms? What happens, right? So what if we make an approximation, which seems to be pretty bold to drop these terms, which look pretty big and dangerous. Um, if we just drop them, what happens, right? So first of all, if we drop them, these equations simplify completely. Um, so, well, that's, that's why we dropped them in the first place. But importantly, we, we, we lose one index here because you have, you're left here with this delta IK, which allows you to remove one of the indices. And that's intricately 
bound at the detailed level to sparse Jacobians now that you're inducing with this approximation. Um, but I don't want to bore you too much here with the technicalities. What's important is that if we integrate this up, we actually end up with equations that look very much like something that real neurons could do. And this is where you see the locality. So if we consider how a synaptic weight should change for, for a, uh, a, a synapse that's connecting neuron J with neuron U, then basically you get this form where you have a Hebbian part where you multiply presynaptic and postsynaptic activity. Then you get a voltage-based nonlinearity, sigma prime in this case, which comes out of our surrogate gradient approach, which is something that rises monotonically up to a firing threshold. Um, and otherwise, it's just nonlinear. That's the thing that I've shown you earlier that's important. Uh, so this could be implemented easily enough by calcium dynamics of real neurons. Um, you get an eligibility trace, which could be implemented by a calcium transient. And you have this feedback factor, which is not entirely clear yet what that is in biology, uh, but it's a third factor that's neuron specific. And we have a hunch that uh, microcircuits might play an essential role in computing this. And that's something we're working on at the moment. But otherwise, this is really local now to a synapse. So it only depends on pre and post synaptic quantities plus this post synaptic quantity, uh, which needs to somehow get to the neuron. And it could be neuromodulators or, for instance, inhibitory um, activity. Right. Putting this all together in these learning rules, you can learn interesting things. For instance, you can put this in a simple spiking network model where we're playing here input Poisson spikes uh, in a repeated manner. You cannot see that it repeats. It's hard to, to see this, but it's repeating. And if you train this network now with this rule online, you can basically write any kind of output pattern in this spike train. And the important thing is really that to achieve this in this network, which is a spiking neural network, it needs to also learn the hidden layer representations. It needs to change the hidden layer spikes um, to achieve this output objective. And that's, of course, now an arbitrary kind of mapping task um, for getting a nice Matterhorn spike train at the output, but we can do uh, anything really and uh, train these networks to do anything uh, also in terms of processing, which is nice. So one thing I'm, I still have to show you is that this approximation we're making, uh, making even though it sounds crazy, uh, does not hurt us much. And that's what's quantified here. So these are different uh, error plots. So these are errors of, of networks trained on different data sets. The Randman is the one I've shown you with the red, just a little bit more complicated with more classes. MNIST, you know, these are speech, different speech processing data sets, in part the ones we recorded. Um, and you see basically, oops, error, different errors, right? So, and in gray, these are feed forward neural networks. And the errors are, and sum and max is not so important, but these are different loss functions we used, okay? So in gray, these are feed forward networks. In red, you have the recurrent neural networks. And for the speech processing problems, naturally they perform better. Uh, so you get the lower error. But importantly, in blue, now you have the networks in which we ignore all the, all the mixed terms, essentially, uh, during training. So these are still recurrent neural networks, but the gradients do not know about these recurrencies. Right? And you can see that you're always losing a little bit of performance, but not that much. And that's really reassuring. It's only an empirical result for us now, but it's very reassuring because it shows for many relevant data sets, these approximate learning roles, they do actually very well. Uh, and we're working on this. So in summary, I'm running short on time here. I've shown you that surrogate gradients are an effective tool for building functional spiking neural networks and studying plasticity mechanisms for, um, from a functionally motivated angle too, as I've shown you with this local learning rule. And as future goals, we, we look now into studying functional networks with anatomical constraints and unsupervised learning as an important aspect of learning. And we would like to validate our models through quantitative comparison to in vivo data. With that said, there's this workshop um, in November, which is on spiking neural networks. And Chiara is one of our uh, co-organizers. Um, we just were notified that SFN put an online event on the same date, so it might move a week earlier, but registration is now uh, open and it's free and it's two half days usually. Thank you very much. And thanks to my collaborators, mainly Emre, uh, Johannes, and uh, Benjamin and Sebastian for the work on the hardware. Thanks a lot, Friedemann.
I, I saw already, I don't have to tell you, but I saw already, you know, comments on the question uh, channel that, you know, uh, a lot of people are enjoying, did enjoy your talk. And I think it was really, really interesting um, and useful for all of us. Uh, so there were a couple of questions that I'm going to read here. Um, so I think one of the questions from uh, Lias that was about uh, local synaptic plasticity rules that you kind of answered during the, the presentation, if you want, I can read it. Um, do you think that we can deduce some local synaptic plasticity rule that only relies on local pre-post neural information and could compete with gradient-based approaches? I, mean, I guess we, we, you already gave this answer, right? Yeah, I, I do um, think so. But I think the third factor is important but this might involve a different type of neuron in the end. So there might be some architecture required, um, but in principle, I do believe that, yes. Okay. I, th this is Andreas. I just want to just interrupt Chiara to say, this is really, was a really great talk. Thank you very much you for presenting a very well prepared uh, summary of this whole, uh, uh, new approach to training uh, spiking neural networks. And also, I have a question, quick technical question. Everything that you've talked about is on fully connected networks. Is that right? What I've shown you, yes. Um, that's exactly right. And it's something we're working on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll go back to the questions in the, in the chat. Um, so, uh, again, from Lies, the, feed, oh, the feedback in the three-factor like learning tool you presented is a global signal, right? If so, how does that impact the locality in space-time? Uh, the feedback is its not entirely global signal because it is neuron-specific. So each neuron does get a different signal. We can reduce the... Uh, so it's, it's not global in that sense that all neurons get exactly the same signal, and that's important. That's important for scaling reasons. Um, the time aspect, that's, um, that's an important point. Um, the signal will come later. Error information can only come later. Um, and this is usually encapsulated in the loss function. So you need to have a loss function which, is, which has a causal filtering effect. And the details actually, there's a lot, I could give a very long answer, but the short answer is you need to delay uh, all these, these coincidence information until the feedback arrives and then um, you can combine the two and update the weights. And that way you, it doesn't violate causality. Okay, and then a question from Massimiliano. Um, so can you comment on the choice of the surrogate gradient from the slide where we were compa comparing the, the, the super spike? Um, uh, it looks like uh, that the super spike is the best choice, but do you have any clue on why this is the case? Uh, so I think this is heavily initialization dependent. So I, I wanted to actually not make the point that is the best choice. It was the best choice for us, which is why we used it. And that's, of course, there's this bias. Um, I think the initialization is, as in all networks, very important. That's something we're currently actually working on to figure out the details. And I think with the right initialization, it shouldn't matter. But it's clear that the ReLU, for instance, if you initialize below um, like, if you initialize and your voltage never actually gets to the regime where the ReLU is non-zero, then there are no gradients and you cannot learn. So, and super spike is, has a power law decay. So it actually, it never goes to zero. And the sigmoid goes also quickly to zero. So I think that's my intuition why it worked best in our samples. But I think if you initialize correctly, the others are fine. Okay. Um... Another question, so the, the, there are many because it was so interesting. One from Sami, um, a question related to the slide comparing the non-local and local learning rules, one of the last ones. Um, you saw that they show good comparative results, so it's encouraging. However, it's from an experiment with one hidden layer, but how is this, how does this comparison, comparison scale? Um, so if you have a much deeper network, can we expect the same comparison? Um, so it's true what we've done, this was one hidden layer. Of course, it's still deep in time. We don't know how much uh, depth and time was required to solving this. And I think that's work in progress. We need to look into it. And that's exactly why I should say, fingers crossed, let's hope that this holds up to more complex architectures. We don't know for mm -hmm. sure. Emre and I are looking into it. 
Okay. And um, there's then a question about the MNIST um, um, performance from Toby. Um, so it says, with feed forward networks, the state of the art with MNIST shows that uh, the error goes below, well below 100%. So um, is he wondering, is he missing something? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the uh, networks have shown you. Have... So the networks have shown you they have hundred neurons only, um, so they're okay. very small, and they have one hidden layer and no convolutions and no data augmentations. Uh, although in the hardware, I think we did use data augmentation in what I showed you. So yeah, I think there's there's room for improvement, um, mm -hmm. and uh, this uh, this should be improved in the future. <laughs> so I was actually maybe this is a very nice question for me, but I. I would expect that if you add the uh, uh, recurrence and if this is important for the temporal aspect. So uh, I understand that this gives um, better results for um, kind of speech data sets, um, but MNIST doesn't really seem to be uh, a data set where you have a strong temporal component, uh, yep. but you still have improvement. Yes, it's usually in the range of half a percent, but people in MNIST people get excited about these improvements so okay <laughs> and and related to to this I mean this is going to be a difficult question and I hope I can frame it correctly so um the so there is a big discussion now in the community about uh, what to use as uh, benchmarks as data sets to really uh, show the advantages of um, doing spiking computation, neuromorphic, and so on. So, MNIST and uh, going then to you know uh, ImageNet or the big data sets of um, object recognition and traditional vision, let's say, maybe they're not the best choices to um, un kind of show the potentials of uh, of this approach. Um, so I wanted to to have a comment from you from uh, about this. So do you do you think there is um, another way? There are other types of data sets that can help uh, to to improve over the state of the art. Also, yeah, I think that's a discussion that goes beyond the remaining thirty seconds we have. But I think there are, there should be there are. It's going to be an iterative process. I think touch is great. So that's why I'm excited about our uh, topic area uh, and it should be temporal. And I, I'm absolutely sorry, but I need to leave now because I'm give, giving another talk in 30 seconds. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> okay, so, thanks a lot. <laughs> but thank you so much for the invitation and let's talk later. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions on the Slack and, and thanks, thanks a lot for the workshop. Sure. Thanks a lot. It was very exciting. Have a great one. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. So I see here on the schedule a single track meeting. Um, Andreas, were you in charge? Well, not so sure. uh, Cornelia, Cornelia, um, I think no other topic area organized something for this period. I don't know if the other okay. topic leaders are here, um, but we did organize a presentation from Ben Grave, who has this recent paper, which I'll share the screen of. I'm, I'm sure he's going to talk about it too, but it's directly relevant to the talk that we just saw, although I'm certainly no expert on it. It's this paper just posted on archive, credit assignment in neural networks through deep feedback control. And um, he's now offered to summarize, give a capsule summary of that. I don't know, is Benny here? I sent him the link. Yeah, I haven't seen him yet. Yeah, he's not here yet. Okay, I'm gonna pause the recording for the moment. Please remind me. Okay, so then so we'll we meet. Time. It's okay, it's expected at 10.15, right on the schedule soon. Well, he told me he would be here at, yeah, it's true. It's expected in 15 minutes. So let's take a break for 15 minutes and we'll come back. We are wrong. He's here. Okay. Oh, you're here. Yeah. 
I'm here. Okay, so Ben Grave is a professor in electrical engineering at ETH Zurich. He's one of the professors at our at INI, Institute of Neuroinformatics, where Shichi and I and Giacomo are, and you know many other people at the workshop. And um, he leads a group that does the biology and theory. He has a number of really nice students, and they have this new paper that they just posted on archive. That Benny's very excited about. It's directly related to the talk uh, by Friedemann Zanke that we just saw. I don't know if you saw it, Benny. If you didn't, you blew it, man, because that, you'd have to relate your paper to what we just saw. I saw it. <laughs> oh, you saw it. Okay, good. Okay, so. And so we have the recordings. And I'll start the recording now. I, I forgot to do that. But anyway, we have the YouTube. So go for it, Benny. The floor is yours and the floor is also open for questions on the questions channel. All right, just to be, how long do I have? Just that I don't. Five minutes to present the idea. Oh, five minutes. You said 15. Okay, good. 15, okay, right. 15 total. Okay. To present so the I'll idea. So get it across. We're very I'll impatient at the quick. workshop. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll make it quick. Hello, my name is Benjamin. Uh, let's dive right in. Okay, good. Now the slides don't move. Okay, good. So this new idea is about uh, similar to, you know, what Friedemann talked about, about plausible deep learning. And um, if you think about, you know, standard uh, uh, standard uh, uh, stochastic ranges and backpropagation, there are, you know, many problems. Uh, and Friedemann, um, you know, dealt with one of them, which is, you know, these networks are not spiking. We kind of attacked with this new idea other kind of things that we think are biologically implausible, which is one problem uh, predominant in the field is called weight transport. The fact that, you know, the forward weights and the backward weights uh, through which the arrow is back propagated are actually completely symmetric. And the other thing is that, you know, the feedback, if you think about it in a real biological network is also, you know, sending, is going back, right, from some top level hierarchy. And it's actually changing the cell activity, right, in a dynamical system, and it's also changing, has an effect on the plasticity, right? So, uh, and that is a bigger, you know, uh, a remark that, uh, you know, think about the brain, I think about brain networks more as dynamic systems, right, where, you know, signals go back and forth, uh, and, and deep networks are discrete in time, deep networks are exactly not that. So we, we're thinking about, you know, ideas how to tackle these two, and people have separately kind of before done that, just to put that out here, right? There are dynamical systems, of course, in neuroscience, think about the force work uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, David Susilla or the uh, work from, recent work from Wolfgang Gerstner, where people trained RNNs, these are kind of dynamic systems to give a certain output. And you, we think of these uh, um, networks here as a, some, some of it as, as a one layer network, right? There's one hidden RNN layer that you can train. And in this case here, people used a controlling approach. So they were trying to send feedback to these networks to get these networks doing the right dynamics or doing the right thing. Good. Um, but what have people not managed is basically training hierarchical deep networks with such a control approach. Uh, the second idea is, of course, the weight transport problem, right? And you can solve this very easily through, uh, you know, a happy learning world that just aligns the weights. This is this nice paper here from uh, the Tweed Lab. Uh, very simple, right? You just have a learning world between the cells that aligns the forward and backward weights. Or uh, this is paper from Timothy Lillicrep, you all know about this uh, feedback alignment where you simply propagate back the error through a random feedback matrix, right? And I'll, I'll just don't go over the motivation because we don't have much time, right? Uh, it's very simple. I just display these two kind of update rules here, right? And I marked already the differences of back propagation and feedback alignment here. Uh, in the upper case, you see back prop, right? Uses the transpose of the weights to send back the error feedback alignment uses a random weight matrix and it still works, right? Which is kind of fascinating. What people find is the arrows, right? The back propagation error and this uh, error that's sent back through these random over time aligned. That means the forward weights somehow take care of this, right? The forward weights change so that the error makes actually sense. This is kind of how you can think about it. Okay, so we were uh, thinking, I, I just jump uh, uh, a couple of slides. So this feedback alignment led then to several other approaches, right? So there's feedback alignment, which you see in B, this direct feedback alignment, where you send the error really from the top into the different layers or indirect feedback alignment, where you send it to a hidden layer and then it actually goes forward, right? And all these approaches work to some extent, right? They have some advantages, disadvantages we can discuss later. So we came up with this new idea where we basically wanted somehow biologically plausible learning and we wanted basically a dynamical system, right? And that was this idea of this paper that we, it's just, uh, you know, at the moment on, 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 on archive, 
uh, we call it deep feedback control. And what's the basic idea, right? The idea is to use a continuous dynamic system uh, that's hierarchical um, to let the error as a feedback signal adjust the neural activities and then have a learning rule that really just looks at the change in activity, right? And just uh, derives kind of an implicit error out of this, out of this dynamics. Yes. So Benny, and of course, I'll ask, yeah. Benny, I'm going to ask you, interrupt you right now and ask you a question which arises naturally. Isn't error back propagation already kind of feedback control? So what's different about yours? You're basically you're already doing feedback control when you do error back propagation. No, it's, it's very different. Yes, yes. You, so what we do is right. We update the activities right of the neurons to get, bring the network in a state that the output error is minimized, right? So back propagation is okay. basically just taking, the, activity. Okay. the error and then sending back the updates, sending back the updates, right? In our case, the neuron uh, can, you see that in the update rule, the neuron uh, can figure out its update by just looking at in which direction am I driven so that the network does the right output, right? Or generates the right output, good. So this is kind of the upshot of this approach uh, you see here, look in the middle uh, in B, you see the network, we have a controller on top and this controller basically receives a, a target, right? Or label something like this, and then gets the input from the network and then sends out a control signal U of T that changes the activity of these neurons until the error at the top output, the control error is minimal, right? Then UT is a certain constant, right? Doesn't change anymore. The network has settled, has converged and and then the output error is, is minimum. In A, you see basically the controller. We have a very simple controller. It's a integral and it's a, a, a proportional part. And then what we kind of, what Alexandra kind of was able to do, and this was also inspired of course from Walter Sens and Charles' work before is to kind of bring this down to or prime this idea onto how a pyramidal cell works, right? That somehow you see here, every cell in our model has three compartments. It has a forward compartment. Uh, that's on the bottom, right? We should call FF. That receives an input, then drives the cell to spike, right? Then there's a feedback signal, which comes from the top in the apical compartment that drives the cell to the desired activity that the network does the right thing, right? And now the cell just needs to look, okay, what's my spike rate when I just get the forward input? And what's my spike rate when I get the forward and the feedback input? And then draw a difference between those and then use that for update. Good. Um, so our network is recurrent and dynamic in a way that information goes forward and then the recurrent weights are through the controller, right? That's important. And we only have this during learning when the network has learned perfectly, right? And there's no label, then this is basically just a feed forward network. Yes. Um, here, we just described the output target, right? Is, is somehow is the uh, output of the network tweaked towards the label. We described the network dynamics as in a classical, you know, dynamic system. Um, it's a leaky integrate, uh, uh, it's not an integrate in fire, it's a leaky integrate neuron. So there's no fire, no spikes at the moment. Um, and then of course we can define steady states, right? So what happens when the, when, you know, at what state is the, is the control signal or the neuron signal when the network, when the output error is zero and the uh, uh, um, control signal is constant. Good. Um, what see is that here we plotted basically the control signal and the error and um, uh, or the, the target signal and, and the error and you see basically that somehow the output of the network uh, uh, so ut is, is the output error it gets smaller and smaller and smaller right and then settles it some, so sorry ut is the control signal it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you expect and then settles at a certain constant and the error, which is the blue curve somehow, uh, or, or the target, right? The network is starts the output at RL and then reaches the target at some point, right? And it can even overshoot, right? And then the controller kind of regulates in the other direction until the network really settles at this zero output error. Good. And here you see the update rule and it's, that's very, it's a very simple rule is um, basically, let me explain this. You have somehow, um, the activity of the neuron here. So, so on, on the very right, you have the presynaptic term. On the left, you have a difference between the activity, right, on the left, as if there would be just feed forward input, and then the spiking activity uh, as by the means of the feed, feed uh, sorry, the, no, no, <laughs> I need to explain it again. So um, you have 
on the left, the activity of the whole neuron integrating the forward and the backward input. And on the right, you have the VFF is the spiking activity just uh, by the means of the feed forward input, right? So it's a difference. You can think about it simple. You know, the cell gets a feed forward input, has a certain activity. We take this activity, then we bring the cell into the right position where the network does the right thing, output error zero. And then we take the activity again. And this is where we want to go, right? Then we take a difference and we learn uh, synaptic, uh, uh, synapse specific by, by multiplying it with a presynaptic term. And this is local in space and time, this rule. Um, we can update all the time when the network settles. Um, of course, what is important that the network displays a stable dynamics, right? If the network is chaotic, then this whole thing doesn't work. So in the paper, we also, uh, Matilda and Alexander did a nice proof that the network is actually stable behaving. That's a kind of a crucial thing for these dynamic systems. Um, does this network learn anything? Uh, yes, um, this is how far we have come. Uh, we call it, or Alexander calls it a modest, uh, you know, uh, machine learning benchmark. This is just MNIST fashion, MNIST and outer encoder. Um, we compare to back propagation and to deep feedback, uh, to direct feedback alignment. And we see that um, DFC, this is kind of the method that, that we have, we call deep feedback control is, is pretty good. It's not, not there yet, you know, not reaching back propagation. Um, but, you know, obviously we, we haven't really optimized it, right? And um, so back propagation uses all these atom optimizers and so on, so on. So, so there's probably more we can, we can tweak to, to, to get it even better. Um, Manny, can I interrupt you? Let yeah. me interrupt you here. Here you have about 2% error rate. That's a number I can compare directly with what I just saw in Friedemann's talk, which is around one or 2%. It's comparable error rate. How big is the network here? It's a feed forward network, but how many oh, yeah. units? I need to check. I don't know. Yeah, it's a small network. It has a couple of hundred nodes. Okay, but this is remarkable. Look how tiny the loss is for these methods compared to the other. If it's achieving such an order of magnitude yeah. smaller loss, why is the error so comparable? Because it doesn't generalize, right? That, that's what, what, what you get, right? <laughs> then you would get a good test error oh. as well. So, so okay. yes, and, and this, you know, you, you get better when you think about regularizers and other things and better optimizers, then, then you can improve generalization usually. But, but you know, ba also okay. back propagation, right? And, and Adam, and that, this has been optimized for 10 years now and, and, and we, we, just, we just can't keep up that, that, that fast. So we're here at the very beginning, I would say, right? For me, it's, it's exciting that this actually works on this, let's call it toy data set, right? It's not, yeah. not a real data set. Yeah, and this is interesting. It does better than direct feedback alignment in, in this outer encoder task. Um, uh, I need to think about, we, we don't, I guess, fully understand why, right? But for some reason, the feedback alignment in outer encoding is, is, is pretty bad. It doesn't work somehow. There's this random feedback because you, you push the feedback through a bottleneck and then you have an information loss of the feedback. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yes. So cool. um, I think... Uh, do I have Let's see if there's any questions on the chat uh, that have been asked during this short, this very nice uh, capsule summary. <laughs> Thank you for... Emre, oh, I hope you have some informed questions. Emma, I know yeah, about I that. Do. <laughs> okay, good. And point and point and draw, please. Yeah. So, and so then, uh, <laughs> um, well, if there are any questions on the on the chat, maybe we should go there because I'm just uh, no. No, uh, okay. there's a question from okay. Sammy. Um, I think that no, was for Freedom. On. Okay, so. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so Ben, uh, let me ask my questions. So this reminds me a lot of predictive coding. You know, there's these predictive coding models um, that are uh, derived from uh, free energy where you have these double optimization loops, right? So one for yeah. the synaptic plasticity and one for the activation. It looks like what you're doing here when you're uh, controlling the activation, it sounds like mm -hmm. one of the two optimizations, namely the op activation one in predictive coding. Am I right? Can you go back to the slide where you show the method, actually, the actual feedback control? You had a nice feedback control diagram, which was too quick to understand. I think it was like slide 13, yeah, which, which 13, one? I think. Yeah, that one. This one? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is a notion of predictive coding, Emmer. Yes, we, we are thinking about this and, and want to explore this more. Um, but, but, but definitely, yes. Um, there's also, I don't know if you're aware of this, like this deep feature visualization. Have you heard about this? Where people really try to generate the maximum input image that, that gener that generates the maximum activity of the output neuron cat or something, right? And, and, and this is the same approach They change the input activity, so the input image, right, to, to create this maximum output. And they use a very similar approach to us. They just don't do it with the hidden layers, right? And then they get, can create an image 
that that really kind of you know is 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 really mostly activating this feature neuron or something. And then you they think of this as visualizing the features of this of this classifier neuron, right? Um, and then Dan okay. Yamans used this in his nice papers called um, um, uh, deep deep synthesis control or something, where they showed the monkey kind of some images, you know, where neurons and tried in the V4, you know, to, to, to synthesize these images to get the maximum activity in layer four. And they used exactly the same approach. They had some control feedback from the top into the input um, that was structured in a way to get the maximum output of this V4 neuron, at least in their deep network. Um, now the tricky, the, the, the key part here is really, how do you learn or how do you initialize the Q weights, right? Because you need to, if you don't get the right cue, and we, we did this very simple, um, and it's, it's of course not perfect. Um, we basically took kind of the, we, we assumed the network would, would be linear and then just multiplied the feed forward weight and out of this generated the feedback weights, right? So it's, it's not the perfect kind of inverse if you so will, but, but it still seems to work. It pushes the network into the right direction. Um, and then we thought about in this paper also a learning rule that would kind of learn these weights um, so that they come actually out like this, um, yes. And some, some interesting um, um, notion here is that for the feedback weights, um, we are actually quite, quite flexible, right? Think about backpropagation has basically one set of feedback weights. And then you could think about um, target propagation, which, you know, just you need to somehow uh, um, the, the pseudo inverse, right, of the feed forward weights. We're kind of even more flexible um, I, probably too too much to go into details here, but um, the weights in our case need to fulfill certain certain conditions that we can actually push that the network is stable and that we can push it into the right direction. And we are very flexible in how we can kind of change these weights or, or choose or learn these weights, which is is an advantage if you if you have, for example, some other type of cost function or some other objective, what you want the feedback weights to do or to to to, to be, yeah. Thank you. Is that helpful, Emery? Yes, yes, for sure. Any, any, anybody is, else is, your, a... is your presentation finished or um, should I wait until the end? No, finish. It's uh, supposed yeah, to be short. Yeah, I just have a summary, it's that, but, but it's basically. Okay. Yeah. Because I ha did have another question, which is about the time, right? So it seems that for every update, you're going to have to wait until mm -hmm. the control basically um, reaches the. Um, your, your output reaches the target, right? So that's only the point where you should start making updates. Um, when you yes, actually so modify correct, the weights. That's yeah, right. That's correct, but under certain assumptions on the, on the dynamics, we, so for this work, we update it continuously all the time with every time step. Um, By low right. pass filtering or setting think, a very low gain on the controller? Like go back to 13 uh, again, right? On the on your on your proportional control gain. Basically, you would you would integrate over time, right? What you could do is, right? You could say, okay, I wait until the very end and then take the difference, or you just integrate over time the steps, right? So you can, in principle, update on every time step um, if you wanted to. But is that the idea of this expecting? integral term? Is that the idea of the integral term here? That you didn't talk uh, about no, this at no, all, right? You have a case. That's just how the con no, that's how the control signal is calculated. Um, that's not the update, uh, the weight update. Right, I think it's missing so the, a ki a, in front of that. Right. If you think there's a yes, yeah. So there's usually Toby. There's PID controllers, right? And we use the P and the I of the PID controller. Yes. Yeah. You know, something that I thought yeah. about is, I mean, you're gonna have to wait, especially in the beginning. It's gonna take some time until the output reaches the target. Uh, your desired target, but if you, I know yeah. the, with the folks in predictive, uh, these predictive coding rules, what they do is that they don't actually wait until it reaches the target. They they do the updates yeah. before, um, and that's enough. And so that that way they can substantially speed up the the learning because as you learn yeah. anyway, you're going to reach that target more more and yes, more quickly. We, we do the, yes, we do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And it's a cool idea. About, I think it could work with with um, asynchronous. So if you, if you want to have it spiking, so we, we didn't we didn't for now you know care too much about spiking, but obviously this this could be interesting at some point. Um, then you could even have you know uh, asynchronous updates, right? With every spike, you would you would then update or something. Yeah. yeah. So really, if I can summarize here, just because I'm still trying to understand the notion here. 
So this is a vector, R, L, R is a vector output, right? It's a vector output, Q, each of these Q is a matrix. This U is also a vector yep. coming from the R. Uh, I don't know how it's related. No, it's related U, to the U, difference. Sorry, U is it's just a, it's basically a scalar, right? It's, it's, it's just one value. Um, it's a constant, and then it's and then you 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 multiply with this with Q, and then you 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 know expand the. So it's a so scalar that's computed from the overall error of R, which is a vector yes, error. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. So it's a scalar but that multiplies. Uh -huh. Yeah, think about it as a mean squared error or something, right? You compare two vectors, and you get one value. So isn't that very similar to this um, three-factor rule then in some way? Because that's a third factor that affects the uh, learning uh, at the... Yeah, yeah some, somehow, somehow. I mean, our update rule effectively implements a, a delta rule here, right? So, so there's, you know, it's basically uh, pre-synaptic and then, you know, you have the activity, right, where, where it is, and then you have the activity where it should be, and, and then you take the difference, right? Very... But where is the U in this equation? I don't see that. So, so that's the oh. point. Um, the the U. Oh, Q is, U. Is, is, I see Q I U. Integrated in, in the in the first term in the phi V I, right? This I see. is where yeah, the it's... U goes. In. So okay, changes so that goes here. The, the activity I want the neuron to be. Yeah. Yes, goes in here. I'm just trying to understand it a little bit better. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then the the second term, Toby, is really just the feed forward activity, right? It's kind of you know, this would be, would be the activity if the neuron just gets feed forward input, but no controller feedback. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope that's helpful to people that are reading this uh, archive paper, which has lots of mathematical detail and lots of proofs and lemmas and stuff like that. So it's heavy duty reading, right? Uh, but you can get to the gist of it better by listening to this first. Um, uh, thank you for sharing that, Benny. I hope you get some useful input from other participants. Yeah, cool, yeah. Emery, it would be great to chat more about, about this if you have time. That'd be great. Maybe making dinner. <laughs> okay. Yes. Are you, are you around in, uh, already in Jülich? Yes. Cool. So I'll be in Switzerland next week. Oh, awesome. So um, for Cornelia, pass the floor over to you as host. I'm not sure if there's anything else on the program for today. I think that's it, really, unless there's another that's, topic area. Right. So the next meetings will be in the groups on different channels. About half an hour. Yeah. Okay. In half an hour. So nothing here anymore. Okay. SMI group and TA or the LTC meetings and AMP meetings. Okay. So you can see from the schedule. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, shall we just stop the stream also? Or you have to stop it, I think, or Terry does. Bye, Benny. Thanks for the for the quick bye, talk. Bye. It was really nice. Bye.